If only people were sitting around on a Friday night listening to us chat and thinking, oh, I really want a stick of butter. They want something sweet and gooey. We crave carbs and they have myriad metabolic effects, one of which is to spike insulin. Just what happens to type one diabetics if they eat nothing but fat? The fat cells get big, they get so big that they have to tell insulin, I'm done. A government issues a mandate telling its people what to eat and boy, they got it wrong. I'm talking today to Dr. Benjamin Bickman, who's a professor of cell biology at Brigham Young University and a lecturer at Peterson Academy. He's done three courses for us. We're talking today primarily because I'm interested in the rise of the Make America Healthy Again movement. And I've been talking to the people who are integrally involved in that movement and trying to determine, strategize about the direction. And that's a very complicated thing to do. And one of the things I want to do is figure out where the most bang for the buck might be had with the least amount of trouble. Almost every problem's like that. There's lots of causes of a given problem, but there's one or two causes that are 90% of the problem. And you want to focus there and maybe have a chance then. And so I talked to Dr. Bickman today about insulin resistance, excess carbohydrate intake, and that's the carbohydrates that are rapidly transmuted metabolically into sugar. And that's pretty much all carbohydrates, by the way. And the fundamental problem with America's health is an abundance of carbohydrates. And so we discussed insulin resistance, which is a metabolic condition that arises as a consequence of too much carbohydrate intake. And then we discussed the multiplicity of cascading catastrophic health effects that produces. Um, type 2 diabetes being particularly uh, well known, let's say, as a secondary consequence, but cancer, heart disease, erectile dysfunction, reproductive dysfunction, um, more generally, uh, high blood pressure, you name it, immunological disease, depression, anxiety. There's almost no serious medical condition that's widespread that can't be traced to excess of carbohydrate intake. And so obviously, it seems to me, that's where the focus should be. And so we walk through the biology, we walk through the practicalities, we walk through some hypotheses about how that problem might be redressed at the government level, but also at the level of individual behavior. And so this is very important. There's likely nothing you can do that will improve your life more, both in the short run, but even more importantly in the long run, than to modify your diet away from high carbohydrate intake. And so we walk through why that is. So join us. So Dr. Bickman, I've been talking to the Maha people about their plans. And it's clearly the case that Americans, Westerners, more broadly, but particularly Americans maybe, are suffering from a slew of unfortunate medical conditions. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to know from you to begin with is if you had to rank order the magnitude of the medical problems that presently confront the West, let's say, mm -hmm. particularly the US, how would you do that? And there, there's a very specific reason I'm asking. Yeah. You know, Whenever there's a problem, maybe you can, if it's a complex problem, maybe you can point to like a dozen, two dozen causal elements. But if you focus, you'll find that three of those are the major contributors. And you could spend an immense amount of time on all two dozen, or you could focus like hell, maybe on the worst problem yeah. and gain 50% of the ground. If you spread your forces out across the entire panoply of problems, you're not going to get anywhere. Like, if there are 24 stakeholders in the system that are making America sick and you take on all 24, all you're going to do is fight endless battles. Yeah. So I'm curious if you had to zero in, you yeah. know, to where you'd get the most bang for the buck. Yep. When you look at the health of America, what do you see as the major impediments, the major problems? 
Yeah, yeah. By if you look at the top ten killers, you can actually thematically lump them all into what I call the, the cardiometabolic crisis, where that encompasses the problems that are overtly metabolic, like type two diabetes, which is a top ten killer. I think it comes in around number six or seven, but also number one, which is heart disease, and. Now, there are others in the top 10, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, that you wouldn't think you'd say, okay, well, Ben's not including Alzheimer's disease in these cardiometabolic killers, and yet I actually am. Even certain forms of cancers are viewed increasingly as a metabolic problem. So it might be that I'm the guy with the hammer, and so I see the nail, but the nail is poor metabolic health, and that's certainly the focus of my efforts. But I like how you framed the question, as much as metabolic health is an underlying issue or a common soil from which all of these noxious plants are growing that we call diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, COPD, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary problems, the, the alternative view isn't that these are each distinct problems, it's just that they're various manifestations of the same problem, namely insulin resistance being the most common disorder. Within the United States, a study published out of University of North Carolina a number of years ago found that 88% of adults have at least one part of what we call the metabolic syndrome, which is a kind of cluster of complications. Interestingly and tellingly, what we call the metabolic syndrome used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome. Mm -hmm. And as much as you framed it from a Western view, just to help people appreciate this, uh, we aren't even in, we're maybe around in the US, number 20 or so with type two diabetes worldwide. The, right. the Middle East, they're, they're experiencing these problems far worse than we are. Even Southeast Asia, these countries where you'd look at the population and think, well, you look healthy, you're only maybe a little overweight. Yep. But there are ethnic differences where body fat, which is so important to this, will predispose people to these metabolic problems at varying levels. But to answer the question mm -hmm. succinctly, the problem is a cardiometabolic crisis, and at the heart of this is this very poorly understood, well, poorly known, poorly discussed problem called insulin resistance. Yeah, okay, okay. So lay out the relationship between insulin resistance and obesity. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's a great question. So insulin resistance is the most common problem. It's the most relevant for chronic disease. Naturally, we want to know, all right, well, where did the villain come from? Yeah. What is the Breaking Bad story? I typically describe and teach that there are two paths. There's, there's fast insulin resistance, which has its own um, noxious stimuli that it comes quickly and it can go quickly. But then there is slow insulin resistance. And this touches on your question, so I'll answer it with that one in mind. One of the ways in which insulin resistance develops is by fat cells that get too big. Now, to, to really confirm, as much as we have a, an obsession on fat, on body fat, we actually look at it kind of incorrectly. We would say, okay, Jordan has 20 pounds of fat, whereas Ben has 30 pounds of fat, so Ben's naturally going to be sicker than Jordan. And yet, it's not the mass that matters most, it's actually the size of each individual fat cell. This is why, in that cardiometabolic crisis, the list of what's killing us, men die more from all of those except Alzheimer's disease. So if you look at the top 10, nine of them go to men, and it's not even close. Men die more from these problems than women by orders of magnitude almost. Hmm. And it's but women are fatter than men. And so it's clearly not an issue of fat mass. Per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at it as a percent body fat, a woman's going to be fatter than a man by design. That's supposed to be that way for reasons that we won't get into. But men have less body fat, but we have bigger fat cells. So I, I promise I'm answering the question. Yeah, yeah. But as a fat cell gets bigger and bigger, it's almost like a naughty little child who's taken the water balloon to the tap now they're filling it, filling it, filling it, filling it. Oh boy, you better take that balloon off or it's gonna pop. Now the fat cell acting in its own best interests, does. To, it has to adapt two ways to ensure that it doesn't pop. It doesn't wanna die in the body. We don't want our fat cells. We don't want any cell to die. That's a very messy, very inflamed process. So one thing, the fat cell as it gets ever bigger, it can't turn off the, the fuel coming in. 
but what it can do is change the fuel coming out. So insulin has an absolute choke hold on fat cells. This is a little outside the question, so I won't quite get around to it yet, but insulin is an absolutely essential signal. As much as we focus on calories, insulin tells a fat cell to grow. And now the fat cell is growing and it's telling insulin, insulin, I am about to pop. And so I have to stop listening to you. And so I'm going to become deaf or I'm going to become resistant to what you're telling me to do. And whereas earlier insulin was telling it to hold on to all of this fat, now the fat cell starts leaking out fat, even though insulin was originally telling it not to. This creates a problem that we can refer to as ectopic fat deposition, because now the fat cell is leaking out these things called free fatty acids. At the same, so blood fat levels are going up. Now that's not normally a problem necessarily, but that should only happen when insulin is low. Now we have this weird state where insulin is high, which should be telling the fat break down to slow down. I'm getting into deep biochemistry actually really well, quickly. Nope. So normally if insulin is, is up because we've eaten some carbs and stuff, then fat in the blood would be down because insulin would be telling the fats to hold on to it. But now, or, or when we're fasting or low carbohydrate diet, then f insulin is down and now we're mobilizing more fat. So normally the biochemistry in the endocrinology is such that if insulin's high, fats are down. If insulin's low, fats are up. Unless the fat cells are overfilled or have undergone hypertrophy or a growth expansion, now you have high insulin and high fats. And so the body can't burn that fat, it has to store it. And so now we start storing fat in tissues that are ill-suited